Uh, every good lesson plan has some objectives. The title of this session has been announced as, for several weeks, Why Luther Died in Bed. Because if you'll look very quickly at what's in front of us here, on the first two pages, Luther is exceedingly unique in that he died a natural death. Uh, by the time we get into England in the late 17th and 18th centuries, it was a little healthier to be a, a reformer, but not until that time. And um, so we want to talk a little bit about what this thing was with Luther. And a second goal of this session is to talk about the fact that Luther was not the only reformer. Uh, if you ask anybody in the street that knows anything about the church, they probably will recognize Luther. As we get more and more secular as a society, that probably will be less and less so. Uh, I'm stunned at how little people know about religion. Uh, the quote, persons on the street. And so, you know, it will not be long before maybe Luther's name will submerge too, but most everybody knows Luther. He remains the most written upon high school history subject. In other words, uh, the name most often written on by high school students is Martin Luther. Um, and that continues to be so and has been so for a long time. He's kind of the hero. We talked uh, two weeks ago when I was here about the fact that uh, uh, there were two videos produced on Luther, one 50-some years ago, which is historically at the moment the better of the two. And then there's another that came out not too long ago by PBS. And it does a very secular thing with Luther, even though it interviews historians and church authorities and all the rest. What it melds is finally the conclusion that this is the story of a little man really breaking a big institution. That's, that's 21st century kind of talk. Uh, that's not really what the Reformation was about. And so even though they do a pretty good job historically, when they wrap it up, they draw some conclusions that, that are terribly secular and essentially incorrect. Um, then Lutheran Brotherhood, Thrivent. I'm sorry, Lutheran Brotherhood is now Thrivent. And uh, Thrivent did a, a special movie with a huge international um, premiere. One of those was in the historic Smithsonian Theater in Silver Spring. And um, uh, I was privileged when I was bishop to be one of the invited guests. And they had people from all over the world there for that premiere. And it was to be a big thing. I've never seen anything submerge into oblivion faster than that movie did. Um, it just didn't make it. It made it in the Midwest where Lutherans are a bit stronger for a little longer. But it, its average run in a, in a secular theater was less than a week. And um, uh, some theaters just canceled the booking altogether. And, and I've I haven't got a copy of it even. I think if I write to Thrive It, I could secure a copy of it. But anyway, as that is, Luther's not the only one. He's not the first to attempt to translate the scripture. He's not the first to raise questions about immorality among the priest and, and immorality in the church at large. He's not the first uh, to question the authority the ecclesiastical authority of the church. Um, what can be said is he's largely the first successful one to do it. And uh, those who came after him suffered in, in other words, while Luther, look at the paper just for a moment, while Luther managed to die a natural death in Eisleben, which is the town in which he was born, which he never spent any time in to speak of shortly after his birth, his father, a, a, co a copper smelter, uh, started a business of his own and moved out. And he lived mostly in Mansfield and went to sco early school in Mansfield. But he was born in Eisleben. He was baptized at St. Peter and St. Paul Church, which is barely a block away from his home. It is not the major church in Eisleben. 
but it is still there, and it is the Church of Luther's Baptism, and the font's still there. Great place to visit. Uh, last place he preached on this earth was also in Le Eisleben, uh, at the church right across the street from where he was staying. Huge, more cathedral-type building, and Luther's pulpit is still there. So if anybody wants to go stand and quote Luther's pulpit, you can do that. Um, he preached just a few days before he died there in Eisleben. Um, but he died from something like the flu or something like that. The medieval diagnosis is not probably very dependable today. And if you turn the page, you'll see that, that uh, from, the, from Scotland on, uh, 1572, which is uh, almost a contemporary of Luther, Luther... Uh, dies in 1546, but uh, 1572, 1564, uh, Calvin and, and um, Knox both escaped execution. They were, in fact, running from place to place, and you'll see that uh, Calvin died in Geneva because he was chased out of France, uh, and then John Wesley in England, who lived a very fruitful and productive life, but also comes a hundred years after the reformer before it. So anyway, it's an interesting kind of thing to see Luther in the right smack in the middle of a list of 12 reformers of note. I need also to say, but let's begin before, now I'm getting into the substance of it, so the Lord be with you. Amen. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this new Lord's day. We're always reminded that each day is a gift of your hand, and this one's no different. Bless us now and those here gathered. Thank you for their interest, their hunger to know. Let the Spirit now lead us and direct us in Christ's name. Amen. So what we recognize is that Luther was not the first uh, to raise some of the questions. He was not the first to work with translating the scripture. Uh, John Wycliffe. Uh, translated the scripture. He was declared a heretic by the Council of Constance, and it was determined that all the books that he, that he had should be burned, and his body exhumed and burned, and that's what they did. Uh, 48 years after his birth, they dug him up and burned him anyway. And uh, there was two reasons for burning, three reasons for burning. The first, the church didn't like you. The second reason was the church can't spill blood. So I guess by burning, they dry us up, but they don't spill blood. And the third reason was they could scatter the ashes in the nearby river so there wasn't a point of pilgrimage for followers to go to. So it's totally destroyed. Uh, it's, it's a 21st century version of what we did with, uh, it's a 15th century version of what we did with Osama bin Laden, you know. <laughs> we, we made it impossible to go to pilgrimage. I'm sorry? Didn't they burn Catholic Church also burned because you could not reunite the body with the soul with heaven? Well, you could say that, but the real reason was simply to, to spare the... Uh, Catholic social relations. Yeah, yeah. So, but the real reason was simply to execute someone without spilling of blood. Didn't always happen. You'll see in the English Reformation, a poor soul was beheaded. Um, and not only that, beheaded by a teenage axeman who missed twice before he finally severed his head, smashed his whole skull the first time, did other damage the second, and finally severed his head. Um, not sweet, and then he put his head, what was left of his head, they put on a stick by the Thames River uh, so people could see it. Um, I, there were other vocations in the Lord that were safer in that period of time. As I said, the issue, is, well, let me also report on Eric Gritch. He's doing fine. Uh, he's still weak. Uh, he was kind of guided around church last Sunday when we had this celebration uh, at which I preached, and I thank God when it was over. They didn't laugh me out of the church, so we're okay with that. But it was a good event, and Eric says he'll come and finish off here as soon as he's feeling a bit stronger. Um, 
He's eating, his color's better, uh, but he's terribly weak. So that's how we found Eric last Sunday. Sunday before, he had mentioned that Luther died in bed, and I said I was going to pick that up today, and that's what I'll do. Um, you notice also, if you notice at this list of reformers, I haven't given you, you know, you can look these people up on the internet and their stories will be six, seven, eight pages long. I decided I didn't want to type that much information. Worse yet, I didn't watch, want to watch my printer have to print out all those pages. Um, but Peter Waldo is one few people have heard of, but you've probably heard of the Waldensians who are folks that follow, it's kind of a small group following, that follow him. Some of them claim he did not organize the Waldensians. Well, that's okay because John Hus did not in fact organize the Fratres Brethren, uh, the, I'm sorry, United Brethren, uh, Unitas Fratres, um, but they organized after his death and then have become the Moravians whom we know today and are now part of the Lutheran World Federation. But Jan Hus did not initiate that group either, but they initiated after his death. So there been, and of course, we have the Wycliffe Bible Society, which continues to translate the Bible in how many languages? I've heard, do you know, uh, Dennis? Well, it's, it's hundreds of languages. And, and he was the first to attempt an English Bible um, but it didn't get very far, but he translated it from the Vulgate. And, um, and in his theological writings, he attacked the papacy and monasticism and even the clergy. He was declared a heretic by the Council of Constance in 1415. That's the same crowd that condemned John Hus. That was a burning council if there ever was one. Um, they didn't get him in time, he died, so then they declared him a heretic that his book should be burned and his body exhumed and burned. And so 48 years later, they exhumed his body and burned it by direct order of Pope Martin V. Ashes were scattered in the River Swift. And so the pattern went. Um, John Huss was burned at the stake. I told you two weeks ago that John Huss, um, that the, the chief judge of Jan Hus uh, was an Augustinian. And he's buried in the chapel of the Augustinian order in Erfurt. You can see his gravestone uh, perpendicular in front of the altar at the chapel in Erfurt, which is a very glorious, beautiful place. And um, when, and he was the chief judge of the council that condemned Hus and <laughs> Luther took his vows just about a hundred years later, cruciform in the, sign, in the shape of the cross, face down, on top of his grave. Uh, as I said two weeks ago, might have caused him to roll over in his grave, you know. That, uh, but at time, Luther was a very faithful monk. Many people have the, the understanding that Luther joined the monastery and a few weeks later started the Reformation. That's not so. There were some years that passed between Luther becoming a monk, a disturbed monk be it, but a monk all the same, and um, no friend of heresy. In fact, he was the prior for that district of the Augustinian order for about 10 years. And he traveled around the order, kept their books, balanced their monies, audited their funds, and also settle their theological disputes. Uh, and as I said, Luther, no friend of heresy. Uh, but when the indulgences came, then a different story started. So let me come back to that in a moment. Um, so you have John Wycliffe, finally condemned and ultimately burned posthumously. Um, then we have John Hus, who was burned uh, in, on 6 July 1415, and you'll begin to notice that sometimes I just give you, like in Waldo's case, 1140 to 1218. We don't have specific dates. Um, but notice what starts to happen. Death, 31 December 1384. Uh, we know that in England. Uh, and then John Hus, uh, 6 July 1415. 
Why do we get specific on the dates all of a sudden? Well, because we know from counselor actions and records when a person was executed. So you begin to get specific dates. Um, in the case of Girano Savonarola, you'll find he never renounced the church, never attacked its credibility, though he was a bit of a, a dreamer. He, he, uh, he destroyed books that he thought were immoral. He destroyed art that he thought was immoral. He ruled Florence for a period of time, nearly a decade. And in that time, he sought to have a kingdom on earth kind of rule. And he was very, very popular. But then he got into having visions and making prophecies and so forth and so on. And the people, the people began to, to believe that he was supernatural. And he was a particular, of course, he attacked the church and some other things, but never renounced the faith. And he was a particular enemy of Alexander the Sixth. And Alexander orders that he be brought to Rome for trial. Well, they tried him instead in Florence. Uh, and uh, under brutal torture, he recanted. Uh, the brutal torture was the rack. You all know what the rack is? That's when you're stretched out until they literally, if you don't give in, they pull you apart, just dis dismember you. Uh, you've heard the phrase, drawn and quartered, well, that's, that's, a, that's an improvement on the rack. They hook your four limbs to four horses and yell and swat them. And you know what happens. Uh, when, a, when a king said, I'll have you drawn and quartered, that was, that was a, a mechanized version of the rack. Um, what's that? Indians did that too, didn't they? I don't know about that. I, I'm not, I don't claim to know much Indian history, but, uh, but at any rate, um, he broke on the rack, he, he recanted, and, um, um, but then every time they'd get him off the rack, he'd recant his recantations. So it was ordered that he be burned. He and two other Dominican brothers were condemned, excommunicated, and hanged. And while they were still hanging, they were burned so we can get rid of their ashes. Interesting, you know. In case we didn't succeed once, you try again. Then comes Martin Luther, and after Martin, and by the way, during Martin Luther's time, uh, at least two Augustinian friars were burned at the stake during Luther's lifetime. Um, so that Lutherans weren't exempt from this, from this capital punishment, but Luther escaped it. Uh, then, of course, Wingley died on the battlefield, but the battlefield he was on was in defense of the faith. The cantons in Switzerland were like the free states in Germany, and they didn't all agree with Zwingli, and finally they ended up in war, and Zwingli became a chaplain to the army and was killed on the battlefield. So he wasn't beheaded or, well, I don't know how he died, maybe he was, but uh, he died in battle. And then we go to England, and you have Thomas Cromwell, and with the two English reformers, Cromwell and Cranmer, uh, it's really a mixture between politics and reformation. And um, I have to be careful when, when I'm with my Anglican brothers and sisters that I tread lightly on this topic. But in the case of Cromwell, for example, Cromwell is the chief minister to King Henry VIII. It's Cromwell who will manage his first divorce. It's Cromwell who will manage his, his marriage to already pregnant Anne, pregnant Anne Boleyn, his mistress. Um, it's Cromwell who will manage the separation of the Church of England from the Church at Rome, who will get this through Parliament and do the actions necessary to separate England from Rome. Um, and he is... Um, um, just the king's right-hand person. But he was more interested in reform than the king was. The very main interest the king had in reformation was to get divorces. And he wasn't much interested in unsettling the traditional faith. And Cromwell, once he got into this and became the Archbishop of Canterbury as well, he begins to slash at things much to Henry's dislike. 
the conservatives rise against Cromwell. I'm shortening a story that's 16 pages long. But his conservative enemies rise against him. They accuse him, first of all, they accuse Anne Boleyn, still under Cromwell's rule, they accuse Anne Boleyn of adultery and with others of the realm, but also her brother. And so they had a mass execution when all the men were first beheaded. And then finally, a bit later, Anne Boleyn is reheaded, beheaded. And of course, now Henry can marry still another queen. Um, Anne Boleyn's real sin was that she didn't bear a son. Uh, or at least that was Henry's excuse. But anyway, uh, Cromwell was Henry's right-hand minister. So I'm not sure whether he was, in fact, the Archbishop of Canterbury or the chief politician of rank. But he got treated as the politician uh, because when he was accused now of also crimes against the king, uh, the king has him beheaded. So he is a reformer who is beheaded. You could have said the king was, had some displeasure with some of his reforms. He did. But there was as much politics involved in this as there was Reformation theology. Uh, follow him is Cranmer, who also becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, serves under three kings, Henry VIII, Edward VI, and Mary I. And uh, <clears throat> when Henry died, Cranmer was able really to go through the Book of Common Prayer that's already been published. He goes through the Book of Common Prayer, makes significant changes in it, uh, more in line with the, with the German Reformation. He's influenced a bit by the German Reformation. In fact, uh, um, there's evidence that he studied at Wittenberg. He matriculated there. Uh, George Spalatin, Luther's uh, chapel priest, um, refers to him in his, in his daily diary. So, um, uh, but he made significant changes, much with Edward VI's approval. So he flourished well and did well until, until Mary came to the throne and Mary has not left the church. She is a Catholic. So because he's the Archbishop of Canterbury, and therefore a Protestant, and therefore a heretic, she almost immediately has the Archbishop arrested, and tried, and condemned. He wrote a recantation of his Protestant faith to several people in authority, including the Queen herself, seeking, quite obviously, to save his life, because he's in the Tower of London, and that is not usually a place that has an exit door back into civilization. And um, as a result of that, um, nothing happened. And finally, he comes to the point of being burned at the stake. At the time he is about to be burned, he recants his recantation and announces to the people in the crowd this is the hand that wrote those heretical documents which I now recant. And this hand will go first into the fire. And he, in fact, did stick his hand out to the fire before it had reached him and held it there until he died. Um, William Tyndale. Um, also a translator, comes from England, leader of the Protestant Reform, the great Bible of the Church of England, which Henry VIII ordered to be prepared, was largely the work of Tyndale, although I'm not sure Henry had any idea that was the case. But Tyndale prayed at his last words, you know, does the condemned have any last words? His last words was that the spirit might open the king's eyes. Well. The king ultimately published his translation of the Bible, so if that's an answer to his prayer, okay. But he was strangled first and then burned. Um, and um, actually, he was hunted down in Brussels. He was betrayed by some of his own comrades. 
arrested in Brussels and died there. Um, John Knox, Scottish. Yes. Yes. So he's going even further for the Protestant away from the Church of England. He's not By the time they hunt him down, Henry is no longer living. And now he's a heretic in Brussels. Okay. I'll get back to that in a little bit too. Okay. Um, thanks for the question. That's, that's a good question. Um, John Knox, uh, related to the Presbyterian Church from Scotland, uh, and you're, it should read in the first, educated at the University of St. Andrew or the University of Glasgow. That's a typo that I did not catch. I'm sorry about that. He was ordained a Catholic priest, soon caught up in the Reformation issues, and the rest is history. Um, he, uh, the rest is there. He finally returned to Scotland and led the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but um, he was a while a licensed priest in the Church of England. He was under some influence in publication of the Book of Common Prayer. When Mary first came to the throne, he went to Geneva. And then uh, influenced by John Calvin, and then to Frankfurt he returned. You can read it there. It's all there. Interesting note. Not only did he die a natural death, but... He's buried under parking space number 23 behind St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. So you can just park your car on Scott anytime you want to, I guess. Maybe the Catholics buy tickets to park in that place. John Calvin, you know a lot about, has driven out of France. Uh, and of course, uh, Zwingli. Uh, had been active in Geneva, so Geneva was an open city, much involved in the Protestant Reformation. So Calvin ends up in Geneva. Uh, he wrote, he was a contemporary of Luther, but boy, just kind of at the end of one life and the beginning of the work in the other. Uh, there are people that say that if Luther and Calvin had ever been able to, to really meet and talk at any length, they would have come to agreement. Calvin was very liturgical. Calvin was very Catholic in his appreciation of church and tradition. These were also true with Luther. Luther and Zwingli could not come to terms on the presence of Christ in the sacrament. Luther said, it says, this is my body, this is my blood, that's that. Uh, Zwingli wanted to say this, is, this represents, and Luther said, but that's not what the scripture says. And so... They just never could come to terms. Historians believe that Luther and Calvin might have. Had somebody bought them a keg of beer and given them three weekends at a, at a castle somewhere, they probably would have worked it out. Uh, John Wesley, we already know pretty well. Um, why isn't Charles there? Because, you know, Charles Wesley kind of got caught up in Methodism and that became the Anglican Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, whereas Charles never finally left the Church of England, though he wrote the hymns that fired up the Methodist uh, movement. Um, Charles and his brother disagreed on that, that, that he, Charles might have said, uh, my brother went too far. So I don't list Charles here, although I mention him. Uh, do I have all the reformers here? Absolutely not. Uh, for example, in Wittenberg, I can name a number of people who were significant in the Reformation. One thinks, of course, of Philip Melanchthon, who carried it on after Luther's death. Uh, Philip Melanchthon will write the Augsburg Confession because Luther can't go to Augsburg. It's not in Saxony. And Luther will live 25 years after the Diet of Worms declares him a heretic. He is free to be hunted, to be put to death at will for 25 years. Except in Saxony, he has, he's in kind of house arrest in Saxony. He can't leave Saxony. So he can go to a castle that from the tower you can see outside of Saxony to Augsburg, and he can instruct Melanchthon a little bit. Luther didn't trust Melanchthon totally. 
He was a great linguist. In fact, he said to Melanchthon, I'll, uh, I'll teach you Hebrew if you teach me Greek. And um, they were great companions. But Luther felt Melanchthon simply would negotiate away crucial issues, that he was sort of too nice a guy. Uh, Luther had a beer stein with the Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer engraved around the side. And, and Luther used to complain that, that Melanchthon was too shallow. He couldn't drink down to the Creed. So, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, there was this solid, solid friendship but subtle unsureness about Melanchthon's toughness in, investiga in, in negotiation. But Melanchthon has to write the Confession of Augsburg because Luther can't go to Augsburg. And the princes sign it, and there are notes back and forth to the castle where Luther is staying. And, um, but he can't go there. Now, why did Luther succeed when all the rest of these had horrible deaths. Some of them had some great successes, but they died in the process. We've already talked about Frederick the Wise, the elector of Saxony, who had such a tremendous clout and influence over the Holy See in Rome because he was one of the five electors who would elect the Holy Roman Emperor for the Holy Roman Empire. And since that person had to be elected, it would be Charles V, who was only about 20 years old, a Spanish king. The Pope would have killed if he had to, to avoid Charles becoming the emperor. But he did not control all the votes um, sufficiently. I don't know what Duke, Fred, if Eric were here, I'd ask him and Eric would know. I don't know who the Elector of Saxony voted for, but since he was a little bit in stress with Rome at that time, he might have voted for Charles, hoping in the politics of things to get some sympathy from Charles. He, in fact, got none. The only sympathy he got was the agreement to try Luther on German soil rather than send him to Rome. Charles agreed to try him at the Diet of Worms, but Charles became a very faithful son of the church and um, uh, so much so that when he was condemned at Worms, uh, Frederick had him kidnapped on the way home. He had safe conduct. In fact, the, the condemnation gave him 20 or 21 days to repent. And um, that amounted to as much as safe conduct back to Wittenberg. And not trusting Charles now, uh, Duke Frederick has Luther kidnapped and, and stowed away in the Wartburg Castle. Um, in 1530, the Peace of Augsburg is signed, and what that amounted to in really wide sweeps was that King Charles has to get the German states together. The army of Germany was not a national army. It was an army of, of city states, of states and cities, and um, like the National Guard is in this country. So in order to get an army to march against the Turks, Charles had to have the princes agree to fight. And um, the issue to everybody in that time was the survival of Christendom. A hundred years before, the Turks had swept into Europe and gone through Europe like a hot knife and butter. Uh, that's where we get the still problems in, in parts of Europe, Kosovo, I think of right off the bat and all the difficulties we've had there. And you notice how when we had that trouble at the breakup of Czechoslovakia, much of Europe wasn't willing to raise a hand. It was finally the American president who flew planes in and gave air cover and did other such things. But mostly the Europeans just said, well, because while it had been an Islamic Christian cohabitant, it had not been happy and there was no love between them. And as a result of that, even in the 20th century, um, Milosevic and others were just able to do terrible things and atrocities after the break of Czechoslovakia. But that comes from the first sweep of the Turks into Europe. Now they're back at the door of Vienna. And it appears that they're about to, again, renew the charge into Europe. 
Christendom was terrified. The Vatican was terrified. It was, they were able to believe that the very future of Christendom was at stake. Um, Luther writes, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who would by craft or sword wrest the kingdom from your son and set at naught all he has done. It was up for grabs as far as even Luther could come to understand that. So Charles agrees at Augsburg. The princes said, we'll fight with us, but you can't fight our faith. So they agreed that if you lived with a, in, a, in a state that was Lutheran, you would be Lutheran, everybody. If you lived in a state where the prince was Catholic, you would be Catholic, everybody. Well, that was okay. But if Luther went to one of the Catholic states, he's still a heretic. So while the peace of Augsburg, now we get to the issue of what happened, why, why you would have one thing happening in one country and, 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 and the, the Inquisition, so to speak, in another. Uh, we had these continuing split loyalties and this, this great sense of anger on both sides. So Luther could never leave Saxony. Um, even though he lived 25 years after the ban was, was imposed. Does that answer the question? And though England would have been safe, he was caught in Brussels. And finally, England wouldn't have been safe once Mary came to the throne either. So the archbishop even got burned in this case. Why did Luther survive? Well, he survived because he had, the, had a number of friends in right places, okay? Let's start with the Duke Frederick himself. Duke Frederick is the elector, the governor of the state of Saxony. Um, he says, as you heard him say in the movie two weeks ago, he says, as Luther owes me his loyalty, I owe him as one of my subject, my protection. And while I do not know this Luther, I hear about him these things. And, uh, you know, there is evidence that we don't, that they may have met only once or twice. But Frederick was also aware that Luther was the star on the faculty of his little University of Wittenberg, which he was trying to build up as a, as a rival university in Germany, and um, particularly the university in Leipzig. And, um, he wanted his little Wittenberg University to get to stardom in a hurry, and Luther was attracting attention all over Germany. So, and students are coming to Wittenberg University because this Martin Luther is teaching there. Frederick knows that, he's no fool, and it greens up his university. Secondly, Frederick's chaplain is George Spalatin, S-P-A-L-A-T-I-N. Spalatin and Luther were in law school together. And Luther has the thunderstorm experience that promised St. Anne if she saves him, he'll become a monk. She does, he does, and you already know that story. Spalatin later, I don't think he had the thunderstorm experience, but Spalatin, a classmate of Luther's in law school in Erfurt, also leaves the law school and becomes a priest. And as the spirit has it, luck has it, who knows, turns out to be the chaplain to Duke Frederick. He's Luther's dear friend, okay? So he's continually telling Luther what the Duke is thinking, what the Duke is doing. But we have to also understand he's most likely telling the, the, the Duke Frederick about Luther, who he is, what he's up to, all these kinds of things. And Duke Frederick will say about Luther, you know, I want a strong teacher for my university and I want a pious man for my people. And, and so Spalatin is saying, I got your man. <laughs> so, so we've got Spalatin continually interpreting Luther. You know, you can hear Duke Frederick saying, you know, on Halloween day, forgive the phrase, what the blank was nailed on my church door last night? 
And Spalatin is there to tell him, well, it's 95 theses. Now, Duke, they're really questions about the church. They're not tagging the church. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so what we then have is Rome starts to flex its muscle against Frederick's subject, his star teacher, his priest. And Frederick doesn't like to have pressure from outside. Uh, the famous line is, you know, let him be judged among his German colleagues, not among the Italian curia. I don't think so, he says to Leander. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to do that that way. Let him be tried in his own country by his own countrymen. Send him to Rome? No. Leander says, but the Pope is, yeah, I know all about that, he says. He knows about the burnings. That's the mercy of the Vatican. So now he's in a posture of, of protecting his subjects, protecting his investment in Luther at this stage in the game. Um, and, and also he sees the kangaroo court at Worms. When Luther is brought there, nobody will. You, two, two questions, Dr. Luther. Are these your writings? Do you recant them? He was never allowed to defend them. He was never allowed to deal with them in, in detail. In fact, he says at Worms, if I recant these, much of them are Christian doctrine that nobody's challenging. I would become a heretic because I've recanted them. Uh, so be specific. What do you want? Let's talk about I expected a conversation. He does not get it. Frederick's there watching. So Frederick knows that the 21 days may not mean anything either. That's why Luther is grabbed up and taken to the Wartburg outside of Mansfield. Now, as the time goes on, this is 1521, as the time goes on, by 1530, we have the Peace of Augsburg. They still need to get this army together to, to checkmate the Turks at the door of Vienna. By the way, um, how many know what a crescent roll is? Crescent roll. Crescent, croissant, yeah. You know what a croissant is? You know where they started? France, I bet you'd say. Wrong. Vienna. And you know how they started? Bakers in Vienna baking them for the army outside the gates of Vienna, which is Islamic. It's the sign of Islam. Anyhow, just a little historical trivia. The, the final thing is that because Luther has Spalatin in the palace, Frederick over the state, then we get to another person who is, who is really, in many ways, his father, confessor, and protector, <coughs> excuse me, who understood Luther's passion, <coughs> excuse me, and also understood what Luther was doing. And um, Jan Staupitz was Luther's father confessor. And he's the one who dealt with Luther at Erfurt, who arranged for Luther to be sent to school to become priest, who then arranged for Luther to become a biblical scholar. <coughs> By the age of 30, Luther has a string of degrees. Um, and then he arranges to send him to Wittenberg to teach. Uh, Staupitz is Luther's patron. He is one of the abbots of the monastery system. He is the father confessor at Wittenberg. Staupitz is also watching what's happening in the church. <coughs> Staupitz finally will say to Luther, you know, after the debate with John Eck, when he has actually attacked the church, and, and again, they wouldn't debate Luther's teaching. They accused Luther in the debate in Leipzig, and Luther wanted this debate with John Eck. He was the key theologian of the church. And so they finally got the debate, and um, Eck does not want to deal with the issues of Luther's writings. He wants to deal with things Luther has said that John Huss said. And finally, at one point in the heated moment of the debate, <coughs> excuse me again, John X says to Luther, Jan Hus said that. And Luther said, I don't care who said it, it's the truth. And with that, 
turned to the judges and said, because Huss has already been a heretic, he was burned. Now that Luther has agreed with Huss, the arguments are over. It was never really a debate. Luther never really got his debate. <coughs> now, as I said, you've got Spalatin, Melanchthon, or there at the Diet of Worms. Uh, so too is Staupitz. Um, they see the process. <coughs> Staupitz calls Luther aside and says, <coughs> excuse me, you've attacked the, the church and I cannot go with you there. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. You've attacked the church. I cannot go with you there. But I release you from the vows as monk. You're no longer under my authority. It was really a freeing of Luther. Later, Staupitz will retire in Vienna. I'm sorry, in Salzburg. And he will write Luther and say, this is not going to come to a good end for you, Brother Luther. Come and join me in retirement. Uh, and tries to get him Salzburg and get him out of the Reformation issues. But Luther survives, dies in bed. Because A, there was a printing press. The former translators didn't have that. Um, B, but the printing press probably is not the major thing we've all thought it was. It just meant that Luther's works could survive and the others were less able to do so. The second was the political arrangement of that time. Uh, a third was the educated people knew that Luther wasn't asking new questions. Erasmus and Luther were mostly friends, although Erasmus wouldn't leave the church with Luther. Of course, Luther didn't willingly do it either. He was thrown out. Um, so that Luther had some things in place that none of the others had. Uh, and as you can see how important that is when, when um, um, English reformer, minister to the king, is pleasing the king, he's able to do anything. When the king didn't like it anymore, he's beheaded. Um, it's it, the political clout. Is, now Frederick dies while Eric is, while he's, uh, while Luther is still living. But, but then Eric's friend. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. That does help. Thanks so much. I get in trouble here drinking in the nave here. You know, sign on the door. Thanks so much. The uh, that helps. So that when Duke Frederick dies, his son inherits the throne and continues his father's practice. Did Luther have support? Yeah, the whole Black Friar Monastery, three stories high, huge building, uh, was emptied when the Augustinian monks followed Luther's direction in, it, in the movement. And so Duke Frederick gives him the whole monastery as a wedding present when he and Catherine von Bora were married. Um, they rattled around in that. Um, because little Wittenberg University had no buildings of its own, Luther's house became Wittenberg University. So they housed the students and housed the Luther family. And Luther, of course, constantly invited everybody to dinner so Katie fed a good handle of them all the time. Um, but anyway, there was all kind of patronage that Luther had. And as long as he stayed in Saxony, he kept his head, quite literally. Um, had he gone out of Saxony uh, into a neighboring province, uh, city-state that was not Lutheran, he could have been arrested and, and burned. So that's why he died in bed. He had, he had friends in high places. How is that any different than where we live today? <laughs> Uh, now your question, did that answer the question about the Brussels death? Thank you. Questions? Yes, Nancy. Well, it wasn't the whole country, it was that particular region of the country. Yeah. Now in Scandinavia, yeah, the whole country. <laughs> 
Well, of course, there was that problem, and it was that problem in England. Mary becomes queen. She's Catholic, so she, not everybody converted. But the official religion of the, of the state was that of its ruler. No, I don't think so. You, you had several things involved in this thing. First of all, was you don't have to use much imagination to understand that in Germany, the Reformation was as much a national issue against the outside power of Rome. Uh, so that to be a follower of Luther was almost to be a German in many respects. Not everybody felt that way, but it was like. And of course, the German reformers had a tremendous problem. Suddenly, you have all these churches that are in your lap. They're now Lutheran churches. And as a result of that, you had to have a structure. Luther wasn't prepared to, to start a new denomination. That was the last thing in his mind. But that's what they ultimately had to do because, and, and it got even worse, it affects Lutheran theology even today. The action of the Reformation means that Lutheran bishops and Lutheran pastors were in many cases not, quote, in succession. And the reason is the line of succession was broken when Catholic bishops wouldn't ordain Lutheran pastors. You lost the Catholic succession. And um, most Lutheran churches in the world today have gone back to it because there are ways to get there. In, in Scandinavia, for example, the whole blessed place went, including the bishops. So succession wasn't a problem there. Um, succession doesn't depend on whether you're still Catholic or not. It depends on whether you have the authority to administer the gospel. So, for example, when I was bishop uh, in Washington, I was not a bishop, quote, in succession. Uh, bishop Graham is a bishop in succession because we've gotten that through other churches that have succession in some cases through Scandinavian churches, some cases through Episcopal churches. Our full communion with the Episcopal church gives us that succession because uh, they have it. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm not here. What is succession? Well, some fail, some succeed. No. <laughs> the question is, who has the authority to preach the gospel? And the Council of Nicaea gathered together trying to settle heresies in the church. Um, and so when the Council of Nicaea had settled this, there were some bishops who were in agreement with Nicaea and some that were not. The Nicaean Council said a number of things. It, it wrote the creed we have in our hymnal. But that was in 325. But it also said all succeeding bishops must be consecrated by three bishops. Therefore, one recalcitrant bishop can go out and consecrate a lot of rednecks. Three bishops have to agree that this bishop's consecration is good for the church. From then on, you know, the tradition of Nicaea controlled who was authorized to preach in the church. It's called succession. And because Rome won the argument at Nicaea, uh, they control the succession. Now, if a, if a bishop is ordained under Roman succession and then leaves the Roman church, um, the church has no mechanism to remove that authority. Only Christ can do that. So that bishop remains a bishop. So the Protestant Reformation in some cases was, I think, fortunate enough to be able to have such properly consecrated bishops become Protestants. The Germans did not. And the Germans had to say out of necessity, not out of theology, ah, who needs them? And uh, so then the Scandinavians weren't ready to say that the Germans were illegitimate. So Scandinavians had it, but didn't require it. <laughs>
You know, it depends on how that history fell after Augsburg. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop because the praise band needs to get in here. And I've run over my time limit. God bless you for being patient. And thank you for the water on. That did help.